Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing some of the integrated and multi-sectoral approaches that address the most critical health challenges affecting the global South with special guests, Tracy Baird, President and CEO of Engender Health, Dr. Mesfin Teklu Tesema, the Senior Director of the Global Health Unit of the International Rescue Committee, and Dr. Dennis Cherian, Associate Vice President of Global Health and Nutrition of Chorus International. So it's great, great, great to have you here. Thank you so much. As I as I said a little bit before the show, I always feel like my role is is to be the perennial student uh, listening and learning from people who are way smarter than I am. So I want to I want to set you up. We're going to go to go to Tracy. Just it's it's so stunning that over 10 million people in the global south annually die of easily 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 preventable illnesses and that number is dwarfed by the number of those suffering from persistent malnutrition disease hunger lack of shelter lack of access to water and sanitation and lack of access to basic basic health care so tracy let's just start with you just sort of on an orientation and then we're going to go around the room uh, your organization and gender health places gender equity for women and reproductive rights at the center of the struggle for health in African countries and in India. Why do you uh, do that? Why are women at the center of that effort? Well, thanks, Mark. It's great to be here and wonderful to be with Ms. Finn and Dennis. I'm big fans of IRC and Chorus, so I think this is a lovely conversation to be part of. Um, and you said in your introduction that you know these are multi-sectoral, integrated, you know, tightly interwoven issues and in gender health with the work we do globally on sexual and reproductive health and rights, on maternal health and addressing gender-based violence, we see gender and gender equality issues as something that cross cuts all of these topics in health globally. I know we're talking about the global South, but the global North is not off the hook either. But one of the things that we see is that, you know, when we have the majority of the global health workforce being female and half of the world's population being female, yet most of the decision makers about global health policies and practices being male, we also see that there's already an inequity built into the system until we can shift the leadership balance. And we see the impact of gender on every health topic that, that we work on and, and probably IRC and CHORUS do as well. For example, with one of the areas where um, where we're we're working in an intersection is the intersection of maternal and reproductive health, nutrition, and gender. And we know that when women have poor nutrition and pregnancy, their infants will be low birth weight and have a lot of trouble catching up. We know that girls with poor educational status have trouble staying in school, which increases their risk of early pregnancy and, and violence. And we know that women, even though many are responsible for the nutritional status of their family, don't have the power to negotiate at the household level, the community level, or the food sector level that men do. So if we don't start unpacking these issues around gender, we will never fully be able to realize all of the wonderful um, solutions and strategies we have in global health. So we are always looking at how we can um, involve men in reproductive health, which often people think is, is a woman's issue. We look at um, how we can address some of the power dynamics and health seeking and healthcare decisions and making sure that not just women, but young people too have a voice in their, in their rights and their health. I have a question about this, uh, Mesfin. When you look at this issue of providing help across boundaries of wealth, very often we're talking about um, resources being galvanized from the G20 countries um, and into the global south. There's a question of, of respect for different approaches that people take in different countries. And in a sense, this interaction between um, G20 countries and countries in the global south could be tinged with a kind of neo-colonialism as opposed to a approach that is taken and embraced from the inside of a country. How do you navigate this very fraught terrain in a way that gets the healthcare 
two people that Tracy is talking about, but also is accepted and embraced as a respectful articulation from one person to another, as if we are all members of the same family, but maybe living in different ha houses. How do we get there? Yeah, thanks, Mark, uh, for having me and for this question as well. And um, certainly, Tracy outlined, you know, the gender and dimension of health. Uh, but I think, as you have outlined, there are, you know, societal and cultural factors that uh, determine the possibility of people to access health care. And global health is global, you know. We all are in the same village, you know, a disease that emerges anywhere in the world that can affect anyone. I mean, COVID is a classic example that a virus can travel throughout the globe in a matter of, you know, days, uh, not, you know, months as, uh, as used to be, you know, uh, during the first influenza pandemic. So um, I think we need to embrace that, you know, we are dealing the same situation together. And certainly we need to be respectful as well, each of our differences, you know, we all come with different cultural and societal, you know, uh, background uh, in some situation, in the some places where we work, I obviously work in fragile humanitarian set settings, even the gender, the social group of healthcare providers and the belief associated with it actually uh, can uh, impact in terms of access to health service and how people judge whether the service is accessible to them or not. You know, for example, a society uh, that forbid, you know, casual physical contact between unmarried men and women would reduce accessibility of health service for women. Uh, so, you know, you don't need to go anywhere further than Afghanistan. Um, and where I worked, you know, in my earlier days of the career, that um, you can't, you know, um, expect a woman to go and seek health service from a man provider. So means well, that you have to sense, look at. In that sense, you would be incompetent because of the cultural context to provide certain services that a woman in Afghanistan would be able to provide. So that sort of collaboration and respect for that culture leads you to provide your services in particular ways. Yeah, so understanding those cultural dynamics. And, you know, even though we are international organization, majority of our staff are local. And we hire Afghani healthcare workers and social workers to provide the service. So uh, we need to provide opportunity for women healthcare workers to provide care for, uh, uh, you know, women who are seeking care. care. And in today, you know, Afghanistan today, women are not allowed to work. That is a big threat for women health in Afghanistan. And we as an organization, we advocate strongly that this policy is actually harmful to health of women and girls. So allowing, you know, women healthcare providers to provide those services is essential for accessibility and acceptability of the service. So as an international organization, we have a responsibility to understand those cultural dynamics help people to gain control of their uh, health by facilitating that you know uh, health workforce development that respect the culture uh, and of course you know ensuring that they are supported with the resource that is needed that's where i think that the point you mentioned about g20 you know who have the resource to be able to help afghanis to have a basic package of health service you know today the afghanis um, are you know suffering from sanction and although, you know, and sanction are blunt in instrument, it doesn't really serve intended purpose. Who are suffering at the end of the day? It's the women and the girls who are needing the health care. I think we need to find a better way to reach to those people with the resources that are available. But Mesfin, we have this issue right now in which women are not allowed to interact now with foreign uh, aid workers, including healthcare workers. How, Dennis, do you get to the point where you're able to bridge these kinds of, of issues. Because on the one hand, the view um, of the Taliban is that this help is an attack on their culture, right? On the other hand, so, so they're cutting off these interactions. On the other hand, if you can't have the interaction, you can't help, right? And so Chorus is not going to invest money and time and treasure 
in a place where you're just being blocked, as tragic as that might be. You can't come in with the chorus army to force people to take your help. How do you navigate that that kind of terrain? Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks to Tracy and Espen as well, who have clearly articulated about the cultural, social dimensions under which we operate. And I think that is a reality we have to accept. To begin with, I think, uh, building trust and um, acknowledging that these cultural aspects not just impact the way healthcare services are used, but also uh, in the in the way providers can interact um, with aid organizations, or for that matter, provider acceptance in a country. So I think, first of all, trying to understand that uh, social context and cultural context is extremely important. You know, at Quarters, we place like, of course, like uh, Engender and IRC as well, uh, but our model of operation has always been working through local partners and therefore um, who are vested and who knows the context and uh, which obviously gives you a greater entry point, I would say, in terms of uh, faster acceptance uh, of providers or the healthcare s- systems that you're trying to um, offer. Uh, and that's an important piece of uh, how I think one could possibly navigate that. In my earlier life, like Meswin, uh, I worked extensively in Afghanistan as well. And one of the pioneering work that I always remember is we pioneered introduction of t- t- digital health in Afghanistan. Um, in 2008, that was the first time ever women used or even had access to mobile phones. And they were trained and equipped in terms of using digital health to uh, respond to child and maternal health issues. But the point is very clear. We were able to do that in a in in a restricted context by able to work with local actors, advocating, influencing, and also finding a clear role for men in this. Men are often the ones who handle technology, but for them to be able to accept their women to handled technology was a transformation, including articulating a role for men in terms of how they can help. You know, Dennis, it strikes me that we're we're sometimes so um, blinded by our own context. You know, if you take a look at how diseases spread and the introduction of smallpox into the Americas by the Europeans, the introduction of various uh, diseases uh, all throughout the global south by Europeans as they traded, right? And then you have the same kind of thing happening based in trade, right? Based in the fact that everybody's getting on airplanes from different places. And so diseases that originated in a particular place that it used to spread very, very slowly, right? Is now spreading very fast. This is something that has been around for all of human history. And so when we look at it as if now suddenly it's it, it's it's happening to us, quote unquote, it's actually something that is that has always uh, happened. And the same thing with our cultural context. I accept my cultural context as normal. You accept your cultural context as normal. Mesfin, Tracy, everybody accepts our cultural context as normal. Well, what happens when all these normals interact? We have to develop a new skill set, don't we, Tracy? You're, you're you're on mute. Thank you. You know, I think sometimes we we look at our cultural context and we think about the geography. Like I I don't know the community where you grew up, Mark, or or Dennis or Mesfin. And certainly my my childhood in Southern California isn't applicable in the same way to the work that we do around the world. But I think the other piece that's so critically important is that we're bringing in communities and people to really speak for themselves so that when you're designing programs to meet the needs of a community, that people with disabilities, people living with HIV, AIDS, adolescent girls and young women, that they're speaking, survivors of, of gender-based violence are speaking for their community. Again, not, it's not always geographic. Sometimes it's about the needs that a, a community or population has. Um, and I think that we, we need to look at it from all of these different angles. And you're right. My own reality is is only shared, you know, perhaps by a handful of other people. And 
It's irrelevant. What is important is that people can can articulate they articulate their needs, be asked about their needs, um, and go through and be part of a, a transformative process, really, to query their own norms and work together with members of their community, whether it's geographic or otherwise, so, to evolve towards where they want to be. So, does your you staff, uh, Mesfin, and and please uh, jump in. Does your staff? Yeah. No, no, I, I was going to just say, following to actually Tracy, you know, outlining we all come with different background, that one thing is in common, you know, human rights are universal and they are universal values. That's what we share together. And it is something that is codified through international instrument and also in, as a humanitarian organization. The standard that we use, like the sphere standard, is basically inspired by humanitarian values and uh, human rights values. So these are the common values that are universal. We apply everywhere we go. So that doesn't mean that we ignore culture. We ignore, you know, societal norms. We respect that. Uh, but you know, access to health service and anyone to give service with dignity. That's a humanitarian value. We cannot compromise on that. Yes, we need to help people understand what does means dignified, you know, life and for someone to access health service without being being harassed or, um, you know, uh, discriminated. So I think we have a common ground that we all start, we all share. And if you agree on those principles, I believe we, we, we can travel a long way. And um, without necessarily, you know, undermining, um, you know, whichever culture we come from. So what you're describing is a basis for cooperation across cultures, right? In other words, a shared value, a respect for for human rights, a respect for um, for the baseline condition of all people. And so what sh- what you're talking about, Mesfin, and I'm, I'd be interested in in having uh, you, Dennis, and you, Tracy, comment on this. The whole idea of differently skilled people, people with different genders working together, different lived experiences. It was mentioned, for example, treating people with HIV or disability. I think, Tracy, you you mentioned that. Does that mean that staffs that you have on the ground would have to, it would benefit you to have people who have experienced HIV themselves having contracted it? Is it, is it beneficial to have people who have disabilities serving people on the ground who are disabled, uh, people from particular geographies or communities or cultures being part of your of your fa- chorus family, uh, Dennis, in order to to be able to then um, uh, provide the medical services in a way that is culturally sensitive and is, is situationally sensitive. How do you feel, Dennis? And then, and Tracy, if you could jump in, that would be great. Well, thanks, Mark. Well, I think uh, that is an integral part of how how we operate in terms of how we staff ourselves. Um, People of all backgrounds are welcome to work here. And I think they are best equipped and enabled to respond to the needs of those kinds of uh, specific populations, whether it be LGBTQ or disability or other minorities. Uh, And I think uh, working in a manner that engages them and uh, and you know effectively uses them to design programs can have greater impact. I remember my time when I used when I worked on HIV programs, working with people who are living with HIV AIDS. They have their associations in Ethiopia, for example. We worked with them and was able to have great impacts. Uh, in, in other words, achieve results more than that targets we said we would achieve. So I think working, equipping them, building their capacities are all in regular parts and required for us to have any impactful health outcomes, I would say. So in a sense, we're redefining the idea of competence, right? Competence is not just the technical piece, right? We have have here uh, two doctors, Right. And then we have people who have different competencies. They might be finance competencies or communication competencies or fundraising competencies or logistics competencies. But we also might have cultural competencies and lived experience competencies. Is that is that how you see it? So we're not when we're talking about diversity. 
we're talking about the ability to actually be effective within context, particularly international context. How do you see it, Tracy? And you're still on mute again. Off now. Um, well, I think going back briefly to Mesfin's point about our fundamental human rights, um, you know, the, the rights of children for education, the right, the rights-based approach to the work we do in, in contraception and family planning, for example, is absolutely fundamental. I agree. And I think part of that is, as you're referring to, Mark, um, making sure that we have the perspectives so we can implement and, and really achieve those rights. There are sort of the, the people who have the who should have the rights and then those who can get in the way. And we need to make sure that we're removing those barriers in terms of, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that we can hire staff that represent every possibility of health issue and lived experience, but we do like, um, like IRC and chorus work with partners that do have that experience. So for example, in Tanzania, one of our key partners is CCBRT, which is a hospital that provides health and rehabilitation services to people in Tanzania with all, all full range of disabilities. And so they are, are, are true partners in designing interventions and programs and services and making sure that when we talk about accessibility and quality, it's, it's from a, that perspective, a cohesive perspective, very rights-based perspective, but also really informed by people with the lived experience and professional experience. Um, and then Mark, also in terms of your, your point about competencies and all of the pieces required to do this work, yes, we need people who know logistics and supply chain management and people who know the accounting and audit and, and the context. And whether it's through our, our staff, our advisors, our partners, um, and especially, I think, in the case of all of our organizations, the, the host government institutions where we're working, the ministries of health, the ministries of education, ministries of finance and others, uh, we, can, we can pull all these pieces together and it becomes, you know, a, really a, a beautiful and complicated um, and necessary tapestry as we pull all that into one place. Ms. Finn, how do we get to the point where uh, people are able to help themselves, where they have... Um, the infrastructure required, um, because part of this response to emergency, which is um, part of what International, Re International Rescue Committee, Committee does, um, part of that doesn't structurally shift the dynamics. In other words, there will be another emergency and another emergency and another emergency. Eventually, we need to strengthen societies so that people can respond to their own emergencies. How do you ensure that after an emergency that you are leaving behind a, a, a system that is able to better respond for itself? Yeah, I, I think as a humanitarian community, we have learned and evolved over many years. I think since the early 90s, you know, uh, of uh, disaster response where the model was to fly in a response team and then leave quickly. And now, you know, people who are living in, you know, everywhere, which are prone to disaster, uh, with better training, preparedness, they'll be able to help, you know, their community and themselves. And in any disaster, anywhere in the world, the first responders are your neighbor. You know, those are the people who come to the rescue uh, immediately, whether that is immediately after earthquake. Today, you know, in Turkey, uh, you know, thousands of people um, died or at least injured and who are rushing to help is their neighbor. So I think, uh, you know, what we are doing is really to develop, uh, you know, either community-based disaster preparedness, uh, helping, you know, local actors to have the tool and the resource they need uh, to prepare for a uh, potential hazard. And, and I think that is where uh, we are making difference you know, many countries uh, have a disaster preparedness, you know, department, although they may not be adequately resourced and capacity. That's where I think international partnership can add value to build local capacity. So that is a model. And through partnership with local actors, we can enable, you know, local responders to be effective in their response to a disaster. But um, again, you know, uh, depending on the scale, uh, no disaster, two disasters are always the same. You know, sometimes it's overwhelm local community's capacity to cope. So that's where I think outside assistance is necessary. And I think that is also complementary to local actors. 
And as always, we should always be starting, you know, with rehabilitation and, you know, leaving behind a strong resilience system uh, after our response. And that means that, you know, training and working with local responders and working with the local system and also ensuring that the institutions that are there are part of the response so that they'll be able to be, uh, 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 you know, uh, respond for future disaster uh, when this happens. So that model of partnership is what is actually helping local communities to be able to prepare and respond to uh, disasters. Dennis, is, is Chorus also paying attention to knowledge transfer, leaving people on the ground who are able to be those first and second responders, basically building up the uh, in-country uh, competency and ability to respond as well? No, exactly. That's how we also operate. As I said, our model has always been working with local partners, and I, I believe 99% of our staff are local. Uh, so in other words, we are identifying skilled people, enabling them, equipping them with the skills and leaving them there itself in their own countries or regions so that they are able to um, you know, act whenever there is a greater need. If you take Ukraine, for example, all of our partners there uh, are local partners. I mean, we don't have any expats working there, uh, but have identified strong, capable local organizations who just need additional resources and skills as Ms. Finn already alluded to. Uh, and so that has been always our way of working. And we continue to uphold that as the most sustainable and also resilient ways of, you know, uh, operating, I would say. We're coming to the end of our time. And I just wanted to share a couple of uh, responses that we've received to, to our poll. We asked, what is the most critical health challenge facing the Global South today? And we got two different uh, responses that that rose above the others. One was climate change, hurting food and water availability. And the other is corruption. Now, corruption is a very fraught topic because one person's way of operating is another person's uh, corruption. How do we deal with with these two issues in a way that um, that is realistic? Right. We cannot switch a light switch on and all of a sudden climate change stops. We can't deal with that. Um, we cannot uh, determine what somebody with how a, people in, in a different country operates. We can influence that, but we cannot immediately determine that somebody is going to operate the way we choose for them to operate. How do we address these two issues, which seem to be beyond any of the capabilities of your individual organizations to address in the short term, societal change, definitions of corruption is again, beyond your ability to address, how do we how do we deal with this? I'd like to just do a quick lightning round. Tracy, do you have an approach that, that you try to, to use on trying to deal with problems that are just intractable and long-term? So I would say there's a, Comment and at first I thought, oh goodness, a question about climate, the climate crisis and corruption, where do we go? We just, you know, but I think that there is a common denominator. I think it's resilience. We know that more resilient communities and as we support community and, and, and societal resilience, we can address better the climate issue. And we know that women and girls are a key part of that. We know that climate and all of the health issues are, it's not just intersecting, they are of one, but resilient communities and supporting communities to, to identify solutions, to be able to act on those solutions and to be able to control the priorities and resources um, that people will make the decisions that will help them address the effects of climate and also health. And I think similarly, health systems and other institutions and their resilience will help us address the broader issues around corruption. I think that when, when health systems, for example, have the tools they need to do the budgeting, the planning, the processing, the staffing, and can fairly recompense the staff from community health workers to, to ministers in an appropriate and, and systematic way, as those systems become more resilient, I think we'll see, um, you know, more consistency and and predictability in their in their actions and decision making. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call resilience our common denominator there. Resilience and the way you describe resilience, it's basically power on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. 
power on the ground. Dennis, I, I know that I was making these, I was, one it was a natural phenomena or, or a phenomenon of nature, right? But you cannot just change it immediately. Corruption is a phenomenon of human perception, right? You cannot just change that, that instantaneously. Um, Tracy's answer is basically power on the ground, which she defines as resilience. Is that your view of, of, of what we need to do in order to respond, to make the world more able to deal with these issues? And rather than, than have, you know, G, G20 countries sort of fly in and fly out as, as Mesfin uh, described sort of past approaches, do you see that as being the response? I do. I mean, I think these are macro issues that are beyond the reach of any of us to respond in a very effective way. But we can co contribute towards that. Um, we all have employed, and right now we do employ in our projects an approach called social accountability, which is a bottom-up approach, making people aware of their healthcare needs, for example, what is the budgeting issues, and uh, how can you work together to articulate what are the minimum quality standards you expect and working with bureaucrats to make sure that uh, I, as a client, get the quality that I deserve to get. So I think it is a slowly but um, effective mechanism that takes a bottom-up approach in terms of holding uh, the you know politicians and governments accountable or uh, responsible for their healthcare service. So that's one approach that has worked. So I think we are small actors in this uh, that is influencing the broader issues of corruption. Um, but it, it is a time-taking process, is for sure. Uh, obviously, there are policy impacts that we can influence as a result of these kinds of approaches that we are implementing. Uh, so I do see um, us as a small change agents in the larger macro issues of governance and corruption. Um, yeah. Mesfin, we're going, we're going to end up with you. You'll have the last word. But it seems that, that what Tracy and Dennis are saying is that we need to have a process of bringing people into the tent, into the tent of this solution, of this empowered group of people uh, like yourself who are bringing solutions locally. But then... As we bring people into the tent, the tent itself is going to change. And we have to be okay with that, right? We have to be okay with the fact that if we're including more people, we're including more voices, we're strengthening solutions, we're creating the resilience that Tracy referred to on the ground and the capability on the ground, the tent itself changes. Do you see it this way as well? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, certainly we all have a role to play. I mean, these are, you know, big issues and it cannot be just left for a few actors. You know, certainly, you know, uh, taking climate change alone, you know, we may feel powerless in the face of big polluters and which would have significant impact in terms of greenhouse gas emission. Uh, but we see our role in terms of helping people even adapt to the changing climate, um, you know, stressed um, uh, uh, world. So that is where our place. And um, and yes, we can advocate for you know that emission reduction, which is absolutely important. There is nothing that's going to replace that. But we can help you know that small whole uh, farmer to adapt the climate change. Uh, whether improving their farming technique, how they use, you know, scarce water resource. And we see it, climate change is a daily reality for our client. And it's an interface of conflict, displacement, climate change is accelerating that. So, you know, the Horn of Africa, the, you know, the last few years have seen unprecedented level of hunger and malnutrition, primarily driven by, uh, you know, climate change. So as a humanitarian organization, we have to be better in terms of efficient use of a resource, uh, whether that is how we treat whether a malnourished child or deliver you know, healthcare services, but at the same time, uh, helping these communities basically to adapt um, in this new reality. And um, uh, the most important is that women are the majority of smallhold farmers. And those are the people who are child care provider, and also the farmers. I think any woman-centered, a feministic approach 
to help those would have significant impact. So I don't see ourselves, you know, the, 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 the place, you know, crowded. It's a big place. We have a role to play, but we just have to be clear what's our role. And don't to be, be paralyzed by a big problem that we cannot reduce two degrees centigrade or 1.5. Uh, and China and US have to agree. Yes, they have to. And that's important, but I have also a role to play. I think that's, if you play that one, we can have impact on our environment and the climate. Well, I think the answers to our last question are, uh, are very instructive in this, in this uh, sense. We asked, do you, who do you believe is responsible to fix the health challenges in the global South? And we got um, 60% of the people said governments. The balance said people in the global South and people in G20s, in the G20s. So if you look at governments, people in the global South and people in, in G20, uh, who's responsible for this? It's all of us. And it's all of us collaborating together. It's using the different competencies that we have, the knowledge that we have, the technical knowledge and the cultural knowledge Tracy Baird, President and CEO of Engender Health, Dr. Mesfin uh, Tekbutesima, Senior Director of the Global Health Unit of the International Rescue Committee, and Dr. Dennis Cherian, Associate Vice President of Global Health and Nutrition, of course, International. Thank you so much for helping us to understand the work that you're doing. Please thank your colleagues, your boards, your staffs, your volunteers, the people on the ground, and the people who are in the central office who collaborate together in addressing these so, these so important issues. And thank you so much for sharing your insights with us.